Strange Fire. Now, what kind of name of, of a sermon is that? Strange Fire. And this is a test. Now, I know some of you are reading through the Bible chronologically. I'm doing it, so I passed out those things. Is there anybody here that's, that's on track? I'm raising my hand because I'm on track. Got behind a couple times, but I'm caught up right now. Well, even if not, let me ask you this question. And no peeking in your bulletins. What do you think this title, Strange Fire, came from? Anybody got a clue? Huh? Acts? Yeah. We can tie it in there. My plan is to tie it in there, but we'll see how the service goes. But that's not the original source of it. Yeah. Kind of. All right, here we go. I was thinking of calling this strange fire or holy fire. Before we get into the meat of this, I want to set the stage with some things in your mind. Things that, okay, we're going to read this, we're going to talk about this. I want you to fire, file it in your mind here so it's, it's right up there. So, you, okay, we're going to talk about this. I promise you it will tie into the message. Now, 1 Peter, the book of 1 Peter, it's, it's a good book. Of course, you know I say that about every book in the Bible, right? This is, this is a couple of decades after, you know, Peter's writing this a couple of decades after the crucifixion, after the resurrection. And he's writing this to Gentiles, mostly to Gentiles. If you read the book, he's going to say that he's in Babylon. He's not in Babylon. He's actually in Rome. And the reason it says Babylon is because that kind of became a code word for we're under persecution. If the Christians and the new church and the new believers were under persecution, they'd, they'd say, you know, man, I, you're in Babylon. You, you're in Babylon. And so you read in First Peter, he's actually in Rome. He has some really neat things to say. It's a, it's a great book. But this scripture here, I want you to get a hold of it. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Now, he's talking to you. He's talking to the Christians. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praise of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Wow. Wow. Now, he's writing to a, a bunch of Christians. He's answering a lot of questions about, man, these guys, what do we do when these guys are beating us and everything? And he's got a lot of instructions to talk to them. And basically what he says is, you act like Jesus. You act like your Lord and Savior. But here the scripture says, you are a royal priesthood. Not just a priest. You're not just... A priest. Now that's every one of you. Every one of you. It's your job to get the message out. You're priests. You're God's hands and feet here on earth. It's your job to get the message out. There's a God that loves you. There's a God that loves you more than you can conceive. There's a God that wants the best for you. But it goes farther. It says you're a royal priesthood. You're of royal lineage. You know, how, how does that happen? Well, the Bible says that we are heirs and joint heirs with Jesus. Yeah. Well, I, we are heirs and joint heirs with Jesus. Jesus is family. He's the king of kings. There's where the royalty comes in. Yeah, you're royalty. King Jesus is family. I tell you what, that's, that's pretty special. So you're a royal priesthood. I want you to get that. 
Many of you will say, yeah, I was just, uh, looking at you, we're sure about that peculiar people part. But. <laughs> By the way, Ken, I really like that scripture where it talked about they shall grow tall. <laughs> tall like cedars of Lebanon. I like that scripture. I'm going to underline that one. How many know this scripture in Hebrews 12, 29? Our God is a consuming fire. Wow. What does that mean? It sounds really great, right? Our God is a consuming fire. I mean, God is so great. <laughs> we kind of, somehow, we... we we bring God down to our size instead of really understanding just how great and awesome God is. The writer of Hebrew here, is, he's saying, man, you know, God is, he is so great. You understand that people couldn't even look at him. No one can look at him and live. He's so great and so awesome. I mean, we, we talk about angels who are so far, so far below God. And you look through the Bible, and when men, in particular, ladies, you got a little break, because the men didn't handle even seeing angels as well as the women do. You know, every time you see a man running into an angel in the Bible, they're usually falling down on their faces like dead men. It's true. There's a couple places where they didn't, but most of the places where they come in encounters with angels, they're like, whoa. And God is so much greater, so far above. He's a consuming fire. And many times in God's word, we're given illustrations, and it talks about fire and how it comes, burns things up. One of my favorite stories is, you know, Elijah and the prophets of Baal. I love that story, you know. He challenges them all. Hey, we'll have a contest. Let's see who, whose God is real and whose God's not. And they had that contest. You know, there's some things about that contest. You know, they, they, they get to go first. You know, they're out there, and these, these prophets of Baal, they're out there. They're cutting themselves, and they're dancing, and they're shouting, and they're doing all sorts of things to try to get fire to come down from heaven. And you got Elijah. What I like about Elijah is he's over there laughing at him. He's taunting him. <laughs> Talk a little louder. Maybe your God's asleep. Maybe he's on a vacation. Wake him up. And they did. They tried harder and harder and harder, but nothing happened. And then, you know, the story, they have him dig a trench around the, the alder, and then they poured water on it. A lot of people forget the problem here is, is there was a drought. That's what all this is about. You know, it's just, you know, they want to kill, kill Elijah because he prayed and there's this drought. So he has them go get three barrels of water and dump on the, you know. I wonder how that went over. He said, no, we got to do this right. Drown it with water. Hey, that's rare. You know, that's, that's a rare commodity right now. Ah, pour it on there pours it on there, and then he just says a few things. God, just show them who you are. Fire comes down from heaven. It says it licks up the water, burns the sacrifice. I love that story. Our God is a consuming fire. When you pray in the name of Jesus and through Jesus, that's who you're getting a hold of. Almighty God. The one that actually holds the entire universe in the palm of his hand. There is nothing impossible with him. Our God is a consuming fire. Where's my clicker go? Set it down. My wife and I have this picture in our house. And... Uh, this is a picture of what it would have looked like. The Israelites in the wilderness. 
And as you read through Exodus and into Leviticus, I mean, it, it, that's the tabernacle in the middle there, and the tents are all set around it. And, it, and then you read it, and it talks about, well, this tribe would be here, and then this tribe would be here, and this tribe. It was all set up. It was very choreographed. It was, everything was in order. There's the tabernacle in the middle. And what do they see? There's the pillar of fire by night. And then we know in the day, the cloud was there in the day. One of the biggest puzzles to me, and yet I see it today, is how could you have something like that and still turn away from God? There it was every day, a cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. It's right there. And yet over and over we read about how the children of Israel turned and followed other gods and made idols. How could you do that? And yet today in Christians' lives, yours and mine and I, I got to tell you, I did it. God has performed a miracle in your life. No question about it. It's, that, that was supernatural. That was God. He did this thing for me. And then down the road, we're just kind of like, mm, I don't know if I'm going to. Oh, I haven't prayed for a long time. I haven't, my Bible's got dust on it. What happened? The fire is there. God's there. He's, Jesus made it so he's just a prayer away. And yet we get busy and we start doing different things and we kind of put God on the back burner. He's back here on this shelf over here. But I got, you know, I got responsibilities. I'm a, I'm a husband. I'm a father. I got to take care of the children. I got to provide, so I got to go to work. I got all these things that, you know, they're, they're important. They're priorities and stuff. And, and somehow we seem to always move God into the back seat. Oh, yes, I believe in God, but he understands. I got to, you know, I got to live. And, I, you know, I'm tired, man. I, I can't go to church. I'm tired. I can't go out and invite anybody to church because I'm just busy. I got to go over here and I got to fix this and I got to fix that and I kind of relegate things. And but then something goes wrong. Oh, Jesus, <laughs> help me, Jesus! Now you're important. I, man, all this other stuff I was trying to take care of, it's falling apart. Jesus, I need you. Help me. Right? Yeah, we bring them out of the back seat real quick when things go bad. Strange fire that I want to talk about comes from the book of Leviticus. Now, in your bulletins, I've got this scripture, and then I've got two other scriptures that talk about this same incident. Now, those of you that attend here all the time, you know what I say. If it's in the Bible, if it's in God's word, it's important. Pay attention. If it's in there twice, really pay attention. If it's mentioned three times, you better be studying and figuring out what the lesson is that God wants you to learn. This incident is mentioned three times. Three times in the Old Testament, and that's, that's what those scriptures are. I'm going to tell you, I'll, so we'll read the scripture here. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense therein and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, 
This is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I must be regarded as, and you could say that with me, holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. So Aaron held his peace. I want to tell you the story. Many of you maybe remember the story. You've got Aaron, the high priest. He's got, you know, he's got all the high priest robe on. He's he, he, the thing in the front that you threw it in the front. And, I mean, he, he's the high priest. He's the one that goes into the Holy of Holies. His sons, he's got four sons. Aaron had four sons. His two older sons, they make them priests also. And they have certain duties to do in this, in this tabernacle. And it's, it's, there's the pillar of fire, and you're doing all these, these, you know, what we call it rituals, you know, all this stuff that God has commanded them to do. And they're getting ready to do this, and everything's going along perfect. And the two sons, who are priests, they've been to the consecration. They know what the rules are. They know what they're supposed to do. And they get this fire because they're going to do the sacrifice. They're going to burn it, right? And they walk in, and all of a sudden, with all this incredible things going on, what a sight it was. Two million people, right? This is really something to see. And they go to offer and light the sacrifice, and all of a sudden, fire comes out of heaven and burns them up. Ooh. You know, what, how, how would you react? You know, I mean, let's just suppose it's me. <laughs> you're sitting out there, and all of a sudden, fire comes down, and your pastor gets burned up. Would I, you think some of you would have the fear? You would say fear of God? <laughs> you think you're like, whoa, what pastor do? Now go before, beyond that. Aaron is there. Those are his sons. His oldest and his next to the oldest son. They've just been struck down by Almighty God. Here comes Moses and says, uh, Aaron, keep this going. Hold yourself together. Don't, don't think evil thoughts. Don't. We got to finish this. We've started it. We've got to finish it. He has Aaron's nephews come on in and drag the bodies out. You can read it. It's in there. You can read the whole story. Drags the bodies out. Then they get Aaron's two younger sons. Oh boy, <laughs> huh? Get them on up there, guys. You imagine those sons. Our brothers just, uh, God just wiped them out. I'd want to know what I did wrong or what they did wrong, right? And Aaron's trying to hold this together. Now, later on in some of those other places where it's mentioned in the Bible, you get, get a little more picture of this that's, that's going on and what's going Aaron, Aaron's brokenhearted. Those were his kids. He loved his sons. But he's having to finish this service, having to finish the sacrifices, he's got to make sure that it gets done. And later on, you know, Aaron kind of fumbles a little bit, not here. He makes it through this. But a little later on, he kind of fumbles a little bit, and he's still distressed over his sons, the Bible says. So Brother Moses gets in there and says, God, <laughs> you know, Here's the deal. He's, he's really distressed. He lost his sons. You know, he's give him a break. And God does. What? Now, come on. Some of you, are, 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 are you saying, what kind of God is this? You know, they're, they're doing. Come on. Is it just me? What did they 
do that was worthy of them being sacrificed, being burnt by God, being killed. Well, they offered strange fire. I'll give you a little kind of background here now so you can understand. In Exodus 40, God, you know, the tabernacle, its altar, the leveler, they were erected, and the interior furniture was arranged. Then it was consecrated before God. It was ready to go. So they have this thing, and they know it's holy. Then you come along in Leviticus 1. The sequence of events keeps going on. God tells them about what you're supposed to do, exactly what you're supposed to do. If you have ever read the book of Leviticus, i got to tell you, most of the time it's boring. <laughs> I'm just telling you. Because it's all these details of what you've got to do. I am so thankful that Jesus fulfilled the law. I don't think I would have made it. There were so many details. Everything had to be done right and at the right time. God tells them the details here in Leviticus. Then we'll jump up to Leviticus 9. The priesthood ministry formal, formally began. It started. Here you are. This is how you do it. You're going to do or you're going to follow all these instructions. This is how you sacrifice and make atonement for sin. This is how you get right with God. This is, this, you got to do a peace offering. You got to do a burnt offering. You got to do all this stuff. And the priests have to do this. And they got to wipe the blood here. And they got to sprinkle the blood there. And they got to put the blood on the ear. And, you know, it's, it's, it would have been hard. I don't think I would have made it. But they're doing everything right. They're trying the best they can. And when they do this, in Leviticus 9, something really amazing happens. They got the altar there, they got it all set. And all of a sudden, fire comes out before the Lord and consumes the burnt offering. Didn't even have to light a match. No starter fluid. They get it all ready and poof, bursts into flames. Now again, what would you do? You know, if I'm up, come on, if I'm up here and there's an altar here and we're putting it all together and all of a sudden it bursts into flames, you'd be like, whoo. Did you see that? Anybody catch that on the camera? And it signaled God's acceptance. Okay, you did everything right. You're doing it right. You did everything right. In Leviticus 6, there's a specific instruction. And this is where we find out what the boys did wrong. And the fire on the altar shall be kept burning on it. It shall not be put out. You go into more detail, read the whole thing there. And the fire upon the altar shall be burning in it. And it shall, be, it shall not be put out. And the priest shall burn wood on it every morning and lay the burnt offering in order upon it. And he shall burn thereon the fat of the peace offering. The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall not go out. So God's saying, I provided you the fire. You keep it going. Don't let it go out. You keep it going. This is a special fire. 
from heaven. It looks just like a fire. It's burning. It burned the stuff up and everything. You keep it going. And then what happened? They knew it. They had the instruction. They went through it. You see, what they did, though, is they had these sensors that they were supposed to get the, the fire, and they're supposed to, but instead of getting the fire from God, they got their own fire, the fire that somebody else had lit, a person. They substituted what God had for something that they had. I don't know, maybe they just thought, you know, fire's fire, right? Now, I don't know if I would have jumped to that conclusion. If I saw a fire that, you know, uh, come down from, I don't know. I, maybe I wasn't there. Maybe it was, maybe when the fire came down from heaven, maybe it was like a lightning strike. <laughs> maybe we could have, well, well, you know, it was a lightning storm, you know. It's, but for whatever reason, they ignored that rule. Whatever reason they ignored, you keep that fire lit and you use that fire forever. Maybe they got casual about it. How many of you have heard me talk about casual Christianity? Oh, you know, I'm a Christian. Uh, you can go so many ways on this message. You keep that fire lit. You keep your love for the Lord going. Does it work? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's... Come on. I got to tell you, there's sometimes when I wake up in the morning, an alarm clock goes off, and I just want to like, oh, you know, it's a day. Right? It's a day. But I got to tell you, I force myself to say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And I, I have a routine. I have a routine, and it starts off with worship. Then I pray. And then I get God's word. That's my routine. But there are many, many days I don't want to do it. And what God's saying here is, look. You keep the fire burning. You keep it burning. It's important. Don't let it, and don't think that this isn't special. Your relationship with Jesus Christ, it's so special. King of kings, the Lord of lords. That's why I wanted to put it in your mind at the beginning of the message. This is God Almighty. You know, I was talking to Minnow this morning, and we were talking about how God stands outside of time. He sees the beginning, he sees the end, because he stands outside of time. He sees everything. And that's who you pray to. I think if we ever really get an understanding of how big God is. And most of us have that understanding. Most of I'm looking out here and I'm seeing miracle after miracle after miracle. I see miracle lives out here. God's did things in your lives. I'm a miracle. My one son's up in Pennsylvania. I sent him a scripture today. It says, Nothing is impossible with God. With man, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. So why do we try to make excuses for God? Well, God didn't answer my prayer. <laughs> God didn't answer. I was praying about this, and man, I prayed. You know, I, I prayed three days. Didn't get an answer. So that must be God's way of saying no. Or the other one is, I prayed, I prayed, and didn't really get a clear answer from God. And 
So he must be saying, wait. You know what it means when you are looking and seeking an answer from God and you don't get one? It means he hasn't answered yet. There's plenty of scriptures in the Bible where, you know, it, it, it talks about people that just, you know, we hear about the fast, they go into fast, they don't eat until they get an answer. Now, I'm not telling you to do, you know, I'm not telling you to go on starvation diets and stuff. But we let it become so casual. We, our lives, you know, we, we're, God's children. The world ought to look at us and say, what's that fire in the sky over them? As you read through the Bible, you know, when the Israelites went into other land, you hear the people, the inhabitants of Canaan, they said, hey, they're coming. They're coming. Now, some of them chose to fight. But there are several places where it mentions, you know, hey, these are the guys that they wiped out the Egyptians. It's been some time ago, but they wiped out the Egyptians. And you see that thing traveling with them? That pillar of fire? I don't know what that is. But if we go against them, we're going against that. Somebody comes against you, they're going against God. If, if. You're right. You got to get it right. No substitutes. Several times this week, I was talking to people about God's word. He says, you know, you're praying for God's will. I need to know God's will for my life. How do I know when I'm praying? That it's God that's answered me. For one thing, it's never going to be contrary to this. That's why it's so important that you read this. That's why the devil works so hard to try to destroy the Bible. I mean, he, he, he worked overtime. You know, I love the Bible and I love the history of the Bible. And, you know, there, there, there's been kings and dictators and religious leaders and religions some that even claimed to be Christian, that tried to destroy the Bible. Because they don't want you to know what it says. Because if you don't know what it says, then it's easy for you to accept a substitute. Something else, something different, something that's been distorted. I want to tell you, I'm going to, I want to give you three ways, three things that you should do if you're praying and you want to know God's will for your life. Because it's important. You want to get it right. You don't want to, you, you don't want to take a substitute. You don't want to get strange fire and think that you're, you know, I'm sure the boys thought that they were just fine. If they really thought that they were doing something wrong, they probably wouldn't have approached it. Or maybe they thought God wouldn't do anything. Hey, it's fire. Fire is fire, right? Yeah, that fire came from God. Well, this fire I made last night, it's fresh fire. It burned up. Ever hear somebody tell you they got a new revelation? I got a new revelation from God. I said, yeah, let me hear it. Let me, wait a minute. Well, let, me, let me get my book here to make sure it checks out. If it's not in here, or if it's contrary to what's in here, watch out. Watch out. And, oh, they're trying to trick you. You're praying for God's will. You need direction in your life. You need something from God. Let me tell you right now, don't 
go to the altar with strange fire. Don't, don't do things that are contrary to this. Don't have sin in your life. God's very plain about that. And I, there are so many people, and I understand this. I, I was there. I, you know, I had a guy come and, you know, a missionary from Africa, pray for me. Tell me I wasn't healed because there was sin in my life. Yeah, that hurt. I honestly don't think there was. I, I, I was trying to be right. But on the other hand, if there had been sin in my life, I would have no right to approach God. Holy altar. To see what we're doing when we approach. We're approaching the cross and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. It's not a stone altar with wood on it and a burning lamb. Last week we saw the pictures of the crucified Christ. By his stripes we are healed. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. When we pray, that's where you're going. You're going to the blood. The blood of Jesus Christ. And you can almost see Father God saying, don't you come with phoniness. Don't you come with faith. Or don't you approach my altar and where I sacrifice my son with something that is just not that important to you. Again, we're taking down the road. Don't leave, okay? I love you. I love you all. Mayor, watch that door. Jim, watch that door. I want to say something. We want to hear from God. We say we do. We say, I need an answer. I, man, I, I, I need a healing. I need this thing taken care of in my life. I need this done and that done and that done. We got a whole list of things that we approach the throne of God about. How important is it that you get to the fire from God or you just throw something else in there? It's really easy to tell. You ready? Just ask the person, you know what? That's really important. That is really important. You, yeah, you, you need an answer. You need an answer. Let's shut the doors, and we'll just pray until we get the answer. One hour, two hour, midnight, don't matter. We're going to stay here until we get an answer. How important is it? How many people would stay? Ooh. How many would actually stay? Well, Brother Stavala, you can't be serious. You can't be serious about that. I mean, you know, God understands I have a life. I have a wife. I have a husband. I have a family I got to take care of. I, I got to go take care of them. So, you know, I got to go to work. I mean, I can't call off work and say, hey, look, I'm not coming into work today because I'm going to stay and pray. They'd fire me. How big is your God? Or how bad do you want that answer? Now listen, we have got an incredible God who loves you so much. He demonstrated it. 
He demonstrated it. Yeah, giving his son. And you remember last Sunday, we spoke about the scars in heaven. The scars that Jesus is going to bear in heaven. Because of you. That's how much he loves you. But so often we go to him just casually. Yes, the Bible says we can go boldly to the throne of grace. Absolutely boldly, but not haphazardly. God, I'd like you to do this. I'd like you to do this. I want you to do this in my life. But I only got five minutes to talk to you. Only got five minutes of time to talk to you. Probably sit in a little while. He's a miracle, by the way. He is a miracle. Probably needs to sit in a different position. But we ask for things, and we really don't want them that bad. We really don't need them that bad. Now, there's another thing. So when you pray, you know, search your heart. How bad do I want this? How bad do I need this? And if you need it, then by all means, pray till you get an answer. Pray until God answers you. Now, he can answer you different ways. He might answer you by saying no. But you're going to know. You're going to know. If you're like, yeah, I prayed, but nothing happened. So I think God's saying no. I think God's saying wait. God will answer you. He'll make it clear. He's got a million ways to do it. Before I get into the next part of how you know those the ways, how you know God's answering you, and the, the scriptures actually lays out a really nice line of how to know God's answers. The other thing is make sure it's important to you. Don't use God like an offending machine. That's number one. Number two, make sure you're right with him. Make sure you're right with God. The Bible's very clear. If you regard the iniquity in your heart, he will not hear you. Didn't write it. God did. It's in his word. If you regard iniquity in your heart, if you've got sin and you know it's sin, and you have not repented of it, why are you going to a holy God? Don't do it. It was dangerous. It was dangerous for them. Get the sin out of your life. Ask the Lord to forgive you. Ask to be washed in the blood. Ask to be seen by Almighty God through Jesus Christ's righteousness. It's not yours. Get it out. Now, how do I know God is answering me? How do I know it's not, you know, the devil? You know, whispering in my ear saying, hey, do this. This is what you should do. All right. Oh. God's word again. First of all, look for the answer in here. And don't just pick one scripture. Don't just one verse. Don't take it out of context. 
Don't do that. You know, make sure that you're getting the whole story. Now, I know some of you are saying, Pastor, you mean i got to read the Bible? Yeah. Yeah, you do. Yeah, and I've got to tell you, coming here to church, you know, I'm, I usually give you lots of scriptures. That's not enough. God has blessed us so much by giving us his holy word. In America, we got, you can go into a Bible bookstore. You, there, there's 50 different translations you can pick from. Most are good. Some are not. So you might have to do some due diligence there and make sure that you're getting a good one. But yeah, you got to read God's word. It's kind of like taking a test and never opening the textbook. <laughs> right? <laughs> Boy, I wish I knew what uh, I wish I knew what the answer was, but it's not there. Well, yeah, it is. It's on this page right here. You just never opened the book. You got to read God's word. Just reading this word and allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to you through the word, it'll change your life. It'll change your life. You know, I, I love the one person that said, this is God's love letter to you. You know, for all the stuff that's in there, and there's some hard stuff. There's, you know, there's, there's, there's some confusing stuff. But there is so much in there that will lift you up, that will strengthen you, that will encourage you. You open it up and you go, Oh, I needed those words. Especially when you realize this is coming from Almighty God. Now, the Bible, you know, it puts some very strong tests on itself. On prophecy. How do you know it's prophecy of God? Well, the person that prophesied was 100% accurate. 100% of the time, absolutely. We've, we've, got, we've really got a, an advantage here because we're sitting way down at this end of history and we can look back and see, well, this guy prophesied this. It might have been hundreds of years before the prophecies came true, but when they came true, they were 100% accurate. Oh, and 100% of the time, every time. Now, I, I think I've given this illustration before, but I just want to give it again so you understand. You know, if somebody says, hey, there's going to be an accident here. It's going to happen at 1 o'clock. It's going to involve a red car and a blue car and four people. One of them is going to break their left leg. And at 1 o'clock, red car, blue car, they have a wreck and somebody breaks their right leg, is that prophecy? No. They got close. 100%, that's God. That's why this book is so incredible. The scientists, the physicists, they can't figure it out. How could it be so accurate? 100% of the time. Every detail says not a dot or a tittle, you know, not, not a little period over the, the little I or the cross on a T's. You know, it's going to be 100% accurate. Now, read God's word. Don't take just one scripture because the scriptures also says, by the voice of two or three witnesses is a thing is established. You pray and you want God's answer to your prayers and you want to make sure that you're, you're hearing from God and not something else. You know what? Sometimes we, we make up things ourselves. We want, you know, it's, it's the other side of the spectrum. We want the answer so bad that we kind of like convince ourselves that this is what God is saying to me. And it, what it really is is what we want to do and not necessarily what God wants us to do because we're convincing ourselves. So you're going to find it in God's word. You're going to be reading along, and you've prayed, and you're going to read something, and 
it's going to speak to you. If that happened, you'd all be thrilled and say, all right, I got a message from God. Yeah, but wait, where's the second witness? Where's the second witness? See, I, God's able to answer you. It's not like he has a hard time. Many times he throws the answer out in front of you and, you know, we kind of like walk right by it. God moves it ahead and says, here's your answer. And then we walk by it again. He is, he's God. He's able to answer you, and he will answer you. Come with a sincere heart. Do your due diligence. Be reading his word. You know, he said to read his word. And then by the voice of two or three witnesses, a thing is established. You take it in context, and then, you know, sometimes you have... And let it be a miracle thing, right? Uh, there's been many times in my life when I've been praying, and I'll get this scripture, and it was like, that's it. That's it. And I'll turn on the radio. Somebody will say the same scripture. I had, that, I had this happen this week, actually. <laughs> You're going to love this about, it was a scripture where it says, feed the flock. Two different times, two different sources. Nobody nobody knew about coming full time. It's like, feed the flock. Feed the flock. Shepherd the sheep. It'll usually come from a source that knows nothing about what your request is. If they know, then it could be them. But if it comes from a source that verifies the scripture and it comes from somebody that doesn't know anything about your situation, you can pretty well be sure. Hmm. That's confirmation. That's confirmation. Now, there's a danger. I want to give you the danger because we're human beings. We're messed up. You know, sometimes we want stuff so bad and we're stuck here in, in time and sometimes the situations are bad and stuff that we begin to tweak, try to tweak what we're hearing and what we're saying. You won't have to tweak it. It won't be mysterious. You know, I, I always get a kick out of these, these people that talk about Notre Dame. You know, how many know who he is? You know, he was supposed to be this guy that prophesied. All right. If you ever read it, it's like, huh? You, know, you make that say anything, and you know, it, it just it's you got to twist this, the twist it this way. I was witnessing to some people in a Walmart parking lot, and they had their own kind of view about God. They had their own translation, and they got me really going when they said, well, you can't know if you're really saved or not, because the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou might be saved. So what translation are you reading? And then there were a couple other places that they went to that, oh, it was messed up. And they were using the Alexandrian text, which was written many years. It was written out of uh, uh, some of the texts that were missing some of the parts and then translated. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And they began to try to explain to me how all this worked and that hell wasn't real. There's no, no real hell. Um, and if, if there is a hell, it's a temporary situation. You're basically thrown in the fires, you're burned up, and you cease to exist. 
I said, you mean to tell me that Almighty God, all-knowing God that wrote this Bible in perfect harmony, misquoted over and over again, and used the word eternal, 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 when he meant temporary, temporary, no, I ain't buying it. So you are working really, really, really hard to get this message that's not there. I says, why don't you take what it says? Yeah, it's kind of a hard thing. You know, I, that's hard for us to understand. That's, hell's a hard concept. Eternal. But we want heaven to be eternal. <laughs> it's that want desire. Oh, I want heaven to be eternal. Oh, it's temporary. It don't work like that. So again, be very, very cautious when you're seeking God's answers to your prayers about twisting something that should be very straightforward to you. It should be just very clear. If you have to twist it and you have to try to make it say something, it's probably not God. It's probably not God. You all stand. I'm going to dismiss here. We have our after church fellowship. We're going to have some food. We're going to be able to eat, and I'll bless the food from here when I pray. I believe that God's got some great plans for this church and this congregation. I'll break that down to the individual. So each and every one of you that are here, I believe God's got great plans for you. He's an awesome God. And I want to see, you know, I, I want to see this place full. I want to see us get to a place where people come in and get saved every Sunday. Give their hearts to the Lord every Sunday. Wouldn't that be awesome? Guess what? It's possible. Because I know our God. And it's His Holy Spirit that speaks to hearts. It's His Holy Spirit that draws people. Is it important to you? See, this whole message is, I want you to be right on in God's will. Every one of you. I want you to know God's will for your life. I want you to know what God wants you to do. Because God's got plans for you, and he's going to use you in great ways. But we got to approach his throne and understand that he's holy, and we do it his way, not our way. You can just turn that volume down a little bit, and I'll pray while the song's playing. When I'm finished playing, we're ready to go. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Lord God, we thank you especially for your word, for your son, Jesus Christ, who sacrificed his self so that we might have a relationship with you throughout eternity. Lord, I pray that you speak to our hearts. Lord, may there not be anything in any of our lives that would cause you not to accept us. And Lord, I pray that when it comes to knowing your will in our lives, that you do speak clearly so that we know your word and we know what you want us to do. Lord, I pray right now that you bless each and every person here. Guide them, bless them in the mighty name of Jesus. And now, Lord, I would pray that you bless this food and this time of fellowship that we're about to have. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Be blessed. My sin was great, your love was greater. Oh, I could say